continuing with Harper Lee's wonderful book, To Kill a Mockingbird. This is the final chapter of part one, chapter 11. When we were small, Jim and I confined our activities to the southern neighborhood, but when I was well into the second grade at school and tormenting Boo Radley became passé, the business section of Maycomb drew us frequently up the street past the real property of Mrs. Henry Lafayette Du Bois. It was impossible to go to town without passing her house unless we wished to talk, unless we wished to walk a mile out of the way. Previous minor encounters with her left me with no desire for more, but Jim said I had to grow up sometime. Mr. Du Bois, Mrs. Du Bois lived alone except for a Negro girl and constant attendance. Two doors up the street from us in a house with steep front steps and a dog trot hall. She was very old. She spent most of each day in bed and the rest of it in a wheelchair. It was rumored that, rumored that she kept a CSA pistol concealed among her numerous shawls and wraps. Jim and I hated her. If she was on the porch when we passed, we would be raked by her wrathful gaze, subjected to ruthless interrogation regarding our behavior, and given a melancholy prediction on what we would amount to when we grew up, which was always nothing. We had long ago given up the idea of walking past her house on the opposite side of the street. That only made her raise her voice and let the whole neighborhood in on it. We could do nothing to please her. If I said as suddenly as I could, Hey, Mrs. Du Bois, I would receive for an answer. Don't you say hey to me, you ugly girl. You say good afternoon, Mrs. Du Bois. She was vicious. Once she heard Jim refer to our father as Atticus, and her reaction was apocalyptic. Besides being the sassiest, most disrespectful mutts who ever passed her way, we were told that it was quite a pity our father had not remarried after our mother's death. A lovelier lady than our mother never lives, she said, and it was heartbreaking the way Atticus Finch let her children run wild. I did not remember our mother, but Jim did, and he would tell me about her sometimes. And he went livid when Mr. Du Bois, Mrs. Du Bois shot us this message. Jim, having survived Boo Radley, a mad dog, and other terrors, had concluded that it was cowardly to stop at Miss Rachel's front steps and wait, and had de decreed that we must run as far as the post office corner each evening to meet Atticus coming from work. Countless evenings, Atticus would find Jim furious at something Mrs. Du Bois had said when we went by. Easy does it, son, Atticus would say. She's an old lady and she's ill. You just hold your head high and be a gentleman. Whatever she says to you, it's your job not to let her make you mad. Jim would say she must not be very sick. She hollered so. When the three of us came to her house, Atticus would sweep up his, off his hat, wave gallantly to her, and say, Good evening, Mrs. Du Bois. You look like a picture this evening. I never heard Atticus say like a picture of what. He would tell her the courthouse news and would say he hoped with all his heart she'd have a good day tomorrow. He would return his hat to his head, swinging to his shoulders in his very presence, and we would go home in the twilight. It was times like these when I thought my father, who hated guns and had never been to any wars, was the bravest man who ever lived. The day after Jim's twelfth birthday, his money was burning up his pockets, so we headed for town in the early afternoon. Jim thought he had enough to buy a miniature steam engine for himself and a twirling baton for me. I had long had my eye on that baton. It was a V.J. Elmore's. It was bedecked with sequins and tinsel. It cost 17 cents. It was then my burning ambition to grow up and twirl with the Macon County High School Band. Having developed my talent to where I could throw up a stick and almost catch it coming down, I had caused Calpurnia to deny me entrance to the house every time she saw me with a stick in my hand. I felt that I could overcome this defect with a real baton, and I thought it generous of Jim to buy one for me. Mrs. Du Bois was stationed on her porch when we went by. Where are you two going at this time of day, she shouted. Playing hooky, I suppose. I'll just call up the principal and tell him. She put her hands on the wheels of her chair and executed a perfect right face. Oh, it's Saturday, Mrs. Du Bois, said Jim. Makes no difference if it's Saturday, she said obscurely. I wonder if your father knows where you are. Mrs. Du Bois, we've been going to town by ourselves since we're this high. Jim placed his hand palm down about two feet from the sidewalk. Don't you lie to me, she yelled. Jeremy Finch, Maudie Atkinson told me you broke down in her Scuppernog Arbor this morning. She's going to tell your father, and then you'll wish you never saw the light of day. If you aren't sent to the reform school before next week, my name's not Du Bois. Jim, who hadn't been near Miss Maudie's Scuppernog Arbor since last summer, and who knew Miss Maudie wouldn't tell Atticus if he had, issued a general denial. 
Don't you contradict me, Mrs. De Voice bawled, and you. She pointed an arthritic finger at me. What are you doing in those overalls? You should be in a dress in a console, young lady. You're going to go grow up waiting on tables if somebody doesn't change your ways. A finch waiting on tables at the OK Cafe. Ha! I was terrified. The OK Cafe was a dim organization on the north side of the square. I grabbed Jim's hand, but he shook me loose. Come on, Scotty whispered. Don't pay any attention to her. Just hold your head high and be a gentleman. But Mr. Du Bois held us. Mrs. Du Bois held us. Not only a finch waiting on tables, but one in the courthouse, long for derogatory term for black people. Jim stiffened. Mrs. Du Bois' shot had gone home, and she knew it. Yes, indeed. What was the world to come when a finch goes against his raising? I'll tell you. She put her hand into her mouth. When she drew it away, it trolled a long silver thread of saliva. Your father's no better than the inward and trash he works for. Jim was scarlet. I pulled out his sleeve, and we were followed up the sidewalk by a fillip on our family's moral degeneration, the major premise of which was that half the finches were in the asylum anyways. But if our mother were living, we would, we would not have come to such a state. I wasn't sure what Jim resented most, but I took umbrage at Mrs. Du Bois' assessment of the family's mental hygiene. I had become almost accustomed to hearing insults aimed at Atticus, but this was the first one coming from an adult, except for her remarks about Atticus. Mrs. Du Bois' attack was only routine. This was a hint of sum there was a hint of summer in the air, and the shadows it was cool, but the sun was still warm, which meant good times coming. No school and dill. Jim bought his engine, steam engine, and we went by Elmore's for my baton. Jim took no pleasure in his acquisition. He jammed it into his pocket and walked silently behind beside me toward home. On the way home, I nearly hit Mr. Link Dees, who said, Look out now, Scout. When I missed the toss, and when we approached Mrs. Du Bois' house, my baton was grimy from having picked it up off the dirt so many times. She was not on the porch. In later years, I sometimes wondered exactly what made Jim do it. What made him break the bonds of, You just be a gentleman, son, and the phrase of self conscious rectitude he had recently entered. Jim probably stood as much guff about Atticus lawing for inward as I had, and I took for granted that he kept his temper. He had a natural, tranquil disposition and a slow fuse. At the time, however, I thought the only explanation for what he did was that for a few minutes he simply went mad. What Jim did was something I had to do as a matter of course, had I not been under Atticus's interdict. Interdict which I assumed included not fighting horrible old ladies. We had just come in t come to her gate when Jim snatched my baton and ran wilding up the steps into Mr. Mrs. Du Bois' front yard, forgetting everything Atticus had said, forgetting that she packed a pistol under her shawl, forgetting if Mrs. Du Bois missed, her girl Jessie probably wouldn't. He did not begin to calm down, and he had cut the tops off of every camellia bush Mrs. Du Bois owned, until the ground was littered with green buds and leaves. He bent my baton against his knee, snapped it in two, and threw it down. By that time, I was shrieking. Jim yanked my hair, said he didn't care. He'd do it again if he got a chance, and if he didn't, and if I didn't shut up, he'd pull every hair out of my head. I didn't shut up, and he kicked me. I lost my balance, and I fell on my face. Jim picked me up roughly, but looked like he was sorry. There was nothing to say. We did not choose to meet Atticus coming home that evening. We sulked around the kitchen until Capernaum threw us out. By some voodoo system, Compronia seemed to know all about it. She was less than satisfactory source of potation, but she did give Jim a hot biscuit and butter, which he tore in half and shared with me. It tasted like cotton. We went to the living room. I picked up a football magazine, found a picture of Dixie Howell, showed it to Jim, and said, This looks like you. This was the nicest thing I could think to say to him, but it was no help. He sat by the windows, hunched down in a rocking chair, scowling, waiting. Daylight faded. Two geographical ages later, we heard the soles of Atticus' shoes scrape the front steps. The screen door slammed. There was a pause. Atticus was at the hat rack in the hall, and we heard him call. Jim? His voice was like the winter wind. Atticus switched on the ceiling light in the living room and found us there, frozen still. He carried my baton in one hand, his filthy yellow tassel trousled on the rug. He held out his other hand. It contained fat camellia buds. Jim, he said, are you responsible for this? Yes, sir. Why'd you do it? Jim said softly. She said you lawed for inward and trash. You did this because she said that? Jim's lift moved. But his, yes sir, was inaudible. Son, I have no doubt that you've been annoyed by your contemporaries 
about me lawing for inward, as you say. But to do something like this to sick old lady is inexcusable. I strongly advise you to go down and have a talk with Mrs. Du Bois, said Atticus. Come straight home afterwards. Jim did not move. Go on, I said. I followed Jim out of the living room. Come back here, Atticus said to me. I came back. Atticus picked up the mobile press and sat down in the rocking chair Jim had vacated. For the life of me, I did not understand how he could sit there in cold blood and read a newspaper when his only st son stood an excellent chance of being murdered with a Confederate Army relic. Of course, Jim antagonized me sometimes until I could kill him, but when it came down to it, it was all he had. Atticus did not seem to realize this, or if he did, he didn't care. Well, we have a break here. Um, if you haven't already, click the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button. And yes, I am drinking cola from a uh, measuring cup. That's Pepsi Hawaii. See? Pepsi Hawaii, made in Hawaii. They don't sell it on the mainland. I hated him for that, but when you're in trouble, you become easily tired. Soon I was hiding in his lap and his arms were around me. You're mighty big to be rocked, Atticus said. You don't care what happens to him, I said. You just sent him on to get shot, and all he was doing was standing up for you. Atticus pushed my head under his chin. It's not time to worry yet, he said. I never thought Jim be the one to lose his head over this, though I thought more trouble with you. I said I didn't say why I had to keep our, we had to keep our heads anyway, that nobody I knew at school had to keep his head about anything. Scout, said Atticus, when summer comes, you'll have to keep your head about far worse things. It's not fair for you and Jim, I know that, but sometimes we have to make the best of things, and the way we conduct ourselves when the chips are down. Well, all I could say is, when you and Jim are grown, maybe you'll look back on this with some kind of passion and some feeling that I didn't let you down. That's a great point. If you really want to know the character of a person, it's how they act when the chips are down. When the times get tough, you got to be resourceful and you got to keep your cool. This case, Tom Robinson's case, is something that goes in the essence of a man's conscience, Gump. I couldn't go to church and worship God if I didn't try to help this man. Atticus, you must be wrong. How's that? Well, most folks seem to think that they're right and you're wrong. They're certainly entitled to think that, and they're entitled to full respect for their opinion, said Atticus. But before I can live with other folks, I've got to live with myself. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. That's a great line. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. When Jim returned, he found me still in Atticus' lap. Well, son, said Atticus, he sent me on my feet, and I made a secret recongruous of Jim. He seemed to be all in one piece, but he had a queer look on his face. Perhaps she had given him a dose of palinol. I cleaned it up for her, and I said I was sorry, but I ain't, and that I'd work on him every Saturday and try to make him grow back. What was the point of saying you were sorry if you ain't, said Atticus? Jim, she's old and ill. You can't hold her responsible for what she says and does. Of course, I'd rather she have said it to me than to either of you, but we can't always have our druthers. Jim seemed fascinated by a rose in the carpet. Atticus, he said, she wants me to read to her. Read to her? Yes, sir. She wants me to come every afternoon, every school on Saturdays, and read to her out loud for two hours. Atticus, do I have to? Certainly. But she wants me to do it for a month, and you'll do it for a month. Jim planted his big toe delicately in the center of the rose and pressed it in. Finally, he said, Atticus, it's all right on the sidewalk, but inside it's, it's all dark and creepy. There's shadows and things on the ceiling. Atticus smiled grimly. That should appeal to your imagination. Just pretend like you're inside the Radley house. The following Monday afternoon, Jim and I climbed the steep front steps to Mrs. Du Bois' house and padded down the open hallway. Jim, armed with Ivanhoe, a book, and full of superior knowledge, knocked at the second door on the left. Mrs. Du Bois, he called. Jessie opened the wood door and unlocked the screen door. Is that you, Jim Finch, she said. You got your sister with you? I don't know. Let them both in, Jessie, said Mrs. Du Bois. Jessie admitted us and went off into the kitchen. An oppressive odor met us when we crossed the threshold, an odor I have met many times in rain-rotted great houses where there are coal oil lamps, water dippers, and unbleached domestic sheets. It always made me afraid, expectant, watchful. In the corner of the room was a brass bed, and in the bed was Mrs. Du Bois. I wonder if Jim's activities had put her there, and for a moment I felt sorry for her. She was lying under a pile of quilts and looked almost friendly. 
There was a marble topped washstand by her bed. On it was a glass with a teaspoon in it, a red ear syringe, a box of absorbent cotton, and a steel alarm clock standing on three tiny legs. So you brought that dirty little sister of yours, did you? was her greeting. Jim said quietly, My sister ain't dirty and I ain't scared of you, although I noticed his knees shaking. I was expecting a tirade, but all she said was, You may commence reading, Jeremy. Jim sat down in a cane bottom chair and opened Ivanhoe. I pulled up another one and sat beside him. Come closer, said Mrs. Du Bois. Come to the side of the bed. We moved our chairs forward. This was the nearest I had ever been to her, and the thing I wanted most to do was to move my chair back again. She was horrible. Her face was the color of dirty pillowcase, and the corners of her mouth glistened with wet, which inched like a glacier toward the deep grooves enclosing her chin. Old age liver spots dotted her cheeks, and her pale eyes had black pinpoint pupils. Her hands were knobby, and the cuticles were grown up over her fingernails. Her bottom plate was not in, and her upper lip protruded. From time to time, she would draw her neither lip to her upper plate and carry her chin with it. This made the wet move faster. I didn't look any more than I had to. Jim reopened Ivaho and began reading. I tried to keep up with him, but he read too fast. When Jim came to a word he didn't know, he skipped it. But Mrs. Du Bois would catch him up and make him spell it out. Jim read for perhaps 20 minutes, during which time I looked at the suit-stained mantelpiece out of the window, anywhere to keep from looking at her. As he read along, I noticed that Mrs. Du Bois' corrections grew fewer and farther between, that Jim had even left one sentence dangling in midair. She was not listening. I looked toward the bed. Something had happened to her. She lay on her back with the quilts up to her chin. Only her head and shoulders were visible. Her head moved slowly from side to side. From time to time, she would open her mouth wide, and I could see her tongue undulate faintly. Cords of saliva would collect on her lips. She would draw them in, then open her mouth again. Her mouth seemed to have a private existence of its own. It worked separate and apart from the rest of her, out and in like a calm hole at low tide. Occasionally, it would say, Pht! like some vicious substance coming to a boil. I pulled Jim's sleeve. He looked at me, then at the bed. Her head made its regular sweep toward us, and Jim said, Mrs. Du Bois, are you all right? She did not hear him. The alarm clock went off and scared us stiff. A minute later, nerves still tingling, Jim and I were on the sidewalk heading for home. We did not run away. Jessie sent us. Before the clock wound and she was on the room pushing Jim and out of it. Shoo, she said, you all go home. Jim hesitated at the door. It's time for her medicine, Jessie said. As the door swung and shut behind us, I saw Jessie walking quickly toward Mrs. Du Bois' bed. It was only 3.45 when we got home, so Jim and I dropped cake to the backyard until it was time to meet Atticus. Atticus had two yellow pencils for me and a football magazine for Jim, which I suppose was a silent reward for our first day session with Mrs. Du Bois. Jim told him what had happened. Did she frighten you? asked Atticus. No, sir, said Jim, but she's so nasty. She has fits of something. She spits a lot. She can't help that. When people are sick, they don't look nice sometimes. She scared me, I said. Atticus looked at me over his glasses. You don't have to go with Jim, you know. The next afternoon at Mrs. Du Bois was the same as the first, and so was the next, until gradually a pattern emerged. Everything would begin normally, that is, Mr. D Mrs. Du Bois would hound Jim for a while on her favorite subjects. Her camellias and her father's in loving propensities. She would grow increasingly silent, then go away from us. The alarm clock would ring, Jessie would shoo us out, and the rest of the day was ours. Atticus, I said one evening, what exactly is an inward lover? Atticus' face was grave. Has somebody been calling you that? No, sir. Mrs. Du Bois calls you that. She warms up every afternoon calling you that. Francis called me that last Christmas. It's that where I first heard it. Is that the reason you jumped on him, said Atticus? Yes, sir. Then why are you asking me what it means? I tried to explain to Atticus that it wasn't so much that Francis said that had infuriated me as the way he had said it. It was like he said it as a snot nose or something. Scout, said Atticus. Inward lover is just one of those terms that don't mean anything, like snot nose. It's hard to explain. Ignorant, trashy people use it when they think somebody's favoring inwards or favoring Negroes over or above themselves. It slipped into usage when some people like ourselves want that in common. Ugly term to label somebody. So you aren't really an inward lover, are you? I certainly am. I do my best to love everybody. I'm hard put sometimes, baby. It's never an insult to be called what somebody thinks is a bad name. It just shows you how poor that person is. It doesn't hurt you. So don't let Mrs. Du Bois get you down. She has enough troubles of her own. 
One afternoon a month later, Jim was plowing his way through Sir Walter Scott, as Jim called him, and Mrs. Du Bois was correcting him at every turn. When there was a knock on the door, come in, she screamed. Atticus came in. He went to the bed and took Mrs. Du Bois' hand. I was coming from the office and didn't see the children, he said. I thought they might still be here. Mrs. Du Bois smiled at him. For the life of me, I could not figure out how she could bring herself to speak to him when she seemed to hate him so. Do you know what time it is, Atticus, she said. Exactly 14 minutes past 5. The alarm clock set for 5.30. I want you to know that. It suddenly came to me that each day we had been staying a little longer at Mrs. Du Bois, that the alarm clock went off a few minutes later every day, and that she was well into one of her fits by the time it sounded. Today she had antagonized Jim for nearly two hours with no intention of having a fit, and I felt hopelessly trapped. The alarm clock was the signal for our release. If one day it did not ring, what would we do? I have a feeling that Jim's reading, reading days are numbered, said Atticus. Only a week longer, I think, she said, just to make sure. Jim rose... But Atticus put out his hand and Jim was silent. On the way home, Jim said he had to do it just for a month and the month was up and it wasn't fair. Just one more week, son, said Atticus. No, said Jim. Yes, said Atticus. The following week found us back at Mrs. Du Bois. The alarm clock had ceased sounding, but Mrs. Du Bois would release us. Live. That'll do. So late in the afternoon, Atticus would be home reading the paper when we returned. Although her fits had passed off, she was in every other way her old self. When Sir Walter Scott became involved in lengthy descriptions of moats and castles, Mrs. Du Bois would become, become bored and pick on us. It's kind of sad, you know, she's dying, this Mrs. Du Bois lady, and all she has left is the books, and she can't see well enough, so she has to have somebody read for her. So, hey, man, it's good to get started on reading early, and uh, it's good to do it your whole life. Jeremy Finch, I told you now. <clears throat> well, um... Jeremy Finch, I told you that you live to regret tearing up my camellias. You regret it now, don't you? Jim would say, certainly did. Thought you could kill my snow on the mountain, didn't you? Well, Jesse says the top's growing back out. Next time you'll know how to do it right, won't you? You'll pull up by the roots, won't you? Jim said he certainly would. Don't you mutter at me, boy. You hold up your head and say, yes, ma'am. Don't guess you feel like holding up, though, your father or what he is. Jim's chin would come up, and he would gaze at Mrs. Du Bois with a face devoid of resentment. Though the weeks had cultivated an expression of polite and detached interest, which he would present to her to an answer to her most blood-curdling inventions. Inventions. At, at last, the day came when Mrs. Du Bois said, "That'll do." One afternoon, she added, "And that's all. Good day to you." It was over. We bounded down the sidewalk on a spree of sheer relief, leaping and howling. That spring was a good one. The days grew longer and gave us more playing time. Jim's mind was occupied mostly with the vital statistics of every college football player in the nation. Every night, Atticus would read us the sports pages of the newspapers. Alabama might go to the Rose Bowl again this year, judging from its prospects, not one of whose names we could pronounce. Atticus was in the middle of a windy seat in column one evening when the telephone rang. He answered it, then went to the hat rack to the hall. I'm going down to Mr. Du Bois for a while, he said. I won't be long. But Atticus stayed away until long past my bedtime. When he returned, he was carrying a candy, candy box. Atticus sat down in the living room and put the box on the floor beside his chair. What does she want? Jim asked Jim. We had not seen Mrs. Du Bois for over months. She was never on the porch anymore when we passed. She's dead, son, said Atticus. She died a few minutes ago. Oh, said Jim. Well, well is right, said Atticus. She's not suffering anymore. She was sick for a long time. Son, didn't you know what her fits were? Jim shook his head. Mr. Du Mrs. Du Bois was a morphine addict, said Atticus. She took it as a painkiller for years. The doctor put her on it. She'd have spent the rest of her life on it and died without so much agony, but she was too contrary. Sir, said Jim. Atticus said, just before your escapade, she called me to make her will. Dr. Reynolds told me that she had only a few months left. Her business affairs were in perfect order, but she said there's still one thing out of order. What was that, Jim? I was perplexed. She said she was going to leave the world beholden to nothing and nobody, Jim. When you're sick as she was, it's all right to take anything to make it easier, but it wasn't all right for her. She said she meant to break herself of it before she died, and that's what she did. Jim said, you mean that's what her fits were? She was a smack heroin addict. Yes, that's what they were. Most of the time you were reading to her, I doubt if she heard a word you said. Her whole mind and body were concentrated on that alarm clock. If you hadn't fallen into her hands, I'd have made you go read to her anyway. It may have been a distraction. There was another reason. Did she die free? asked Jim. 
As the mountain air, said Atticus, she was conscious to the last, almost conscious. She smiled. And cancer, and cancerous. She still disapproved hardly of my doings and said I'd probably spend the rest of my life bailing you out of jail. She had Jesse fix you this box. Atticus reached down and picked up the candy box. He handed it to Jim. Jim opened the box. Inside, by wads of damp cotton, was a white, waxy, perfect camellia. It was snow on the mountain. It was a snow on the mountain. Jim's eyes nearly popped out of his head. Old hell devil, old hell devil, he screamed, flinging it down. Why can't she leave me alone? In a flash, Atticus was up, standing over him. Jim buried his face in Atticus' shirt front. Shh, he said. I think that's her way of telling you everything's all right now, Jim. Everything's all right, you know? She was a great lady. A lady? Jim raised his head. His face was scarlet after all those things she said about you. A lady? She was. She had her own views about things, a lot different from mine, maybe, son. I told you that if I hadn't lost, if you hadn't lost your head, I'd make you go to read her. I wanted you to see something about her. I wanted you to see what real courage is, instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. Mrs. Du Bois won all 98 pounds of her, according to her views. She died beholden to nothing and nobody. She was the bravest person I ever knew. Jim poked up the candy box and threw it in the fire. He picked up the camellia, and I went off to bed. I saw him fingering the white petals. Atticus was reading the paper. That's uh, that's, that's what the real courage is. It's when you know you're defeated, and you keep fighting, and you keep striving, and you keep getting picking yourself up. You know, don't congratulate me on my accomplishments. Congratulate me on how many times I picked my ass up off the fucking ground and kept going. So uh, with that being said, if you haven't already, I need you to click the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button. It's not going to be that much dilly on you. And um, also, I just want to point out, I was in a college course once and the teaching assistant, I was trying to explain how college football is more important in the South than it is anywhere else in the United States. And uh, the way Atticus talked about Alabama football in there just reinforced that. The class was at University of Texas and it was called History of the South. And I was trying to explain to the teaching assistant who like, was giving this lecture that football is much more popular in the South because they don't have any professional sports teams. There are no professional sports teams in the state of Alabama. There are no professional sports teams in the state of South Carolina. There are no professional, there's one pro city in the state of Georgia, you know, and it goes on and on like that. And so football has always been huge in all the Southern states. And if you look at all the national champions for the past 50 years, the majority have come from these sparsely populated states. So uh, I know that's a bit off topic there. Um, but if you enjoyed my reading, like I said, hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button. And uh, that was a really important chapter in this book. That was the last chapter of part one. And so I hope uh, you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks for watching.